This video is going to give you an opportunity to practice drawing resonance structures for different molecules. Before doing this video, it's important that you know two things. Number one, you need to know what a resonance structure is, because I'm not going to talk about that. And number two, you need to understand what curved arrow notation represents, because I'm also not going to talk about that, but I am going to use it. This is really just a video that's going to help you practice coming up with resonance structures. So we are going to look at three different molecules. Here's the first one that we're starting with. And our goal is to draw two additional resonance structures for these molecules. So we're gonna come up with two more structures. There are definitely going to be more than three total resonance structures for these molecules, meaning that I'm only gonna come up with two more. You might see additional resonance structures and that's fine. Um, but like I said, we're just going to draw two for each one. So when we are looking at an original molecule and we're asked to come up with a resonance structure and we don't have any hints about what that resonance structure should look like, really left, um, left to ourselves to figure out how we would like to move electrons around. Now, I want you to remember when you're getting ready to draw resonance structures, you are only allowed to move lone pairs of electrons and double bonds or triple bonds some of the electrons in the double or triple bonds you cannot move single bonds because that would cause a bond to break and that's not allowed when we're drawing resonance structures so we have to maintain connectivity so that's going to be the most important thing that we're going to focus on in practicing these structures like in this first molecule here we have a lone pair of electrons that we could move we have a lone pair of electrons up here theoretically that we could move and then we also have a double bond that we could work with. When we're moving electrons around, we're not allowed to move them wherever we want. So if we are moving a lone pair, that can be moved to form a double bond or a triple bond to the same atom that was holding the lone pair. So for example, if we decide that we're gonna move this lone pair right here, we can only use that lone pair to turn it into a double bond that is associated with the carbon atom that was originally holding the lone pair. If we were to move one of these lone pairs, we would only be allowed to move that lone pair to form a double bond or a triple bond with the oxygen atom that was holding the lone pair. If we are moving a double or triple bond we typically when we're moving double or triple bonds typically they are going to turn into a lone pair and that lone pair is going to be on one of the two atoms of the bond. So if we were to choose to move this double bond, we would move the double bond, turn it into a lone pair, and that lone pair would have to go onto the oxygen or onto the carbon of the double bond. Basically, the message here is that when we're moving electrons around, they have to stay associated with the atom or atoms that they were originally associated with. You can't take the electrons and move them to some other side of the molecule. They don't move that far. So going by this last rule that we talked about moving double bonds or triple bonds to form lone pairs let's let's just do that let's take the lone or excuse me the double bond on the carbon and let's move it oops let's move it and when we move it we can choose to move it either onto the oxygen or onto the carbon. It really is our choice. I'm gonna to choose to move that double bond up onto the oxygen. And uh, you might be saying, well, how did she know to put it on the oxygen? How did she know to not put it on the carbon? I wanna emphasize, I don't know that. I'm just picking 
to put it up onto the oxygen. I could have just as well chosen to move it down onto the carbon. It's just a choice that I made. So here is the structure that we get when we move that double bond up. We create a third lone pair on the oxygen. This causes us to have a negative formal charge on the oxygen. And also when we lose that carbon-carbon double bond, our carbon atom now only has three bonds around it, which gives that carbon atom a positive formal charge. Let's draw one more resonance structure for this molecule. So now when we're looking at this molecule in terms of what are our choices of what can we move, we don't have any double or triple bonds anymore, which means that we have to move a lone pair of electrons. If we take one of the lone pair of electrons on the oxygen, we are only allowed to move them down to the carbon atom. And that would basically undo what we just did. It would send us back to this structure right here. When we're drawing resonance structures, we're trying to come up with new, unique structures, not redraw the same structure twice. So because we can't move this uh, lone pair of electrons on the oxygen and come up with a new structure, it's not an option for us which means our only option is the lone pair of electrons on the carbon. And the only place that they are allowed to go is in between the two carbons to make a carbon-carbon double bond. They cannot go in between a carbon and a hydrogen. Hydrogen is not allowed to have double bonds. So when we make that move, the resulting structure has a carbon-carbon double bond. We still have all three of those lone pairs up onto the oxygen. Here is resonant structure number three. Again, there might be more. These are just the three that I have chose to draw. Let's look at another example. So here we are starting with a molecule that has no formal charges. Um, in terms of what kind of choices do we have, we have a double bond that we could move. If we move that double bond, it's going to turn into a lone pair, and the lone pair is going to be on either one of those two carbons. Our other option is to move one of the lone pair of electrons on the bromine, and if we do that, the lone pair of electrons would be used to form a double bond in between the carbon and the bromine. And again, we can choose to start with whatever we want to start with. So I'm going to choose to start with the carbon-carbon double bond, and I'm going to move the electrons onto the carbon on the left. And again, if you're wondering, I have no idea how she knows that. How does she know that? I don't know that. This is just the choice that I am making. You get to choose which electrons you want to start with, and in a case like this, you get to choose which carbon atoms you're going to put the electrons on. So when I made this move, I created a carbon that had three bonds and a lone pair, which is a negatively charged carbon. And I left a carbon with only three bonds, which is a positively charged carbon. So there's the first structure that I have. And now I'm going to come up with something else. Like I talked about in the last example, we can't take these electrons and move them back. That just recreates the structure that we started with, and our goal is to create new structures. So that means we're stuck working with one of the lone pairs on the bromine, and the only place that it can go is to form a carbon-bromine double bond. So the structure that we get will look kind of funny. Uh, halogen with a double bond looks weird. But there it is. There's our resonance structure. Let's practice with one more. So here's one more example. This one, we don't have a lot of choices of how to start drawing this resonance structure. We only have lone pairs. We don't have any double bonds to work with. And in terms of what we can do with the lone pair of electrons, we only have one choice. We theoretically could move the lone pair in between either of the sulfur-carbon bonds. 
However, if we move the lone pair over here to this position, it would create a double bond between the carbon and the sulfur. And look at how many bonds that carbon atom now has. It has one, two, three, four, five, which is never allowed. You're never allowed to give carbon five bonds. So because of that, we only have one choice of where those electrons can go. And that's actually kind of unusual. It's not, it's not very common for us to not have a lot of choices about what to do when we're drawing a resonance structure. So we move the lone pair of electrons to the right. We form a sulfur-carbon double bond. And that moves the positive formal charge up onto the sulfur. Sulfur is like an oxygen in terms of its valence. So this is like an oxygen atom with three bonds and a lone pair. That gives it a positive formal charge. Let's see what else we can draw. So um, for our next structure, we have this lone pair. We've already talked about why we can't move it to the left. Could we move that lone pair to the right again? What would that do? Well, that would give us a triple bond between sulfur and carbon, which look at the carbon atom, look at how many bonds it would have. That's too many bonds for carbon. So we can't do anything with this lone pair, it's stuck. That means we have to do something with the double bond. We're going to, when we are uh, moving double bonds in resonance, our only option is to turn them into a lone pair. We can't take that double bond and move it back to the sulfur because that just recreates our starting structure. So again, our only option is to take that double bond and move it onto the carbon atom as a lone pair. And again, this is an unusual example uh, in the sense that you don't have a lot of choices about what to do with these resonance structures. So here's what we end up with, and what are the formal charges on this? A carbon atom with three bonds and a lone pair is negatively charged, and that's sulfur, that's really weird. So let's calculate its formal charge. Sulfur has a valence of six, this sulfur has two bonds, and it has two non-bonding electrons. So that's a formal charge of plus two. Gross. That's yucky.